really privileged to be uh, sharing the screen and the stage with such dignitaries and I think it will be, uh, when I got this topic, it was something which was pondering my mind that day in and out, I also prefer SGLT2 inhibitors to be my first choice of drug. But yes, when I went inside, I thought let's now dig in and find out some, some cases where SGLT2 inhibitors, you know, even if I want to use, I may not be, you know, able to use it. So I'll be taking my 11 minutes through and uh, I think everybody, I'll leave, I'll, I'll leave everybody thinking at the end that I think so, all patients cannot be given uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, or all subtypes of type 2 diabetes. So yes, I'm against this and there are some things that we need to ponder upon. Are all type 2 diabetic patients phenotypically same? One. Secondly, are, are SGLT2 inhibitors all that safe? And lastly, do SGLT2 inhibitors cater to the need of every type 2 diabetic as a blanket therapy? It's like SGLT2, you know, being proposed by Dr. Mayur, uh, by Nawazuddin saying, Apunich Bhagwan hai, in Gangs of Vasipur, that no matter happens, I will be there and uh, I am going to be the king. But he also gets demolished in Gangs of Vasipur, so he's like a man-made god. So SGLT2, in not all cases, can have this picture. We'll be trying to discuss that further on through my slides. We are Indians uh, with different ethnicity itself. Every every uh, you know kin and corner having different uh, picture, so we cannot generalize all patients of type two diabetes having the same phenotype. And I think uh, this is a uh, you know a, a, a submixture of something which I you know recently read about uh, about the subtypes of type two diabetes. Now we were just knowing about type two diabetes as insulin resistant, obese type two diabetics. But what else? We in our clinical practice are now finding different kinds of, of phenotypical type 2 diabetics which was you know it is a Scandinavian study which was collaborated and uh, uh, with the Indian uh, uh, INDAB and uh, ICMR study and they wanted to study through the Scandinavian study they had put on uh, four phenotypes of type 2 diabetes that is subtyping and there they found out four phenotypes severe insulin deficient diabetes, insulin resistant diabetes it was a combination of insulin insufficient and insulin resistant diabetes and MARD that is mild age related diabetes. This thing could be extrapolated again in our southern study where it was uh, you know collaborating with more than 20,000 subjects and uh, the criteria was they took the C-peptide levels into consideration, the BMI, the HDL levels, the triglyceride levels and uh, the HbA1c for that matter the ketone levels and based on that they took out the conclusions that we also Indians have similar phenotype which, which we see in our clinical practice also. Uh, day in and out we do not get now morbidly obese type 2 diabetic patients. It, it is quite debatable that we are getting lean type 2 diabetic patients also that is visceral adiposity with less musculature and also we are also getting uh, you know it is you can differentiate it from LADA because of autoimmunity negativity but we are also getting type 2 diabetic patients which are having insulinopenia. So in such category of patients can SGLT2 inhibitors be safely given? That is something which is my debate today also. So yes, uh, if, if we you know, make such clustering of type 2 diabetes, what is going to give us the advantage of that we can accurately classify the patient and based on the pathophysiology we can give that target drug to that patient. This is what is very much important. So this is called as precision diabetes. This is something which is very much important. And I know uh, there has been a lot of talking about SGL2 inhibitors being safe. They are safe. There is no doubt about it. But if I am using specific category of patients where I am using SGL2 inhibitors, I have to look upon the, the milder risks also involved. So there are risks involved. As you can clearly see, though in multiple studies they have been, they are, you know, uh, all the CVOTs, at the end of the day, they are saying the results are quite comparable with the UTIs, but post-marketing surveillance has proven and also we see in our clinical practice day in and out, the risk of UTI is quite common and in certain category of patient is going to be a pain for us. Again, secondary mycotic infections are also very common. Uh, the risk of hypoglycemia if used inadvertently without reducing the insulin dosage and the secretagogues is again going to be a problem and volume depletion. Typically, we have, uh, you know, lean elderly diabetic patients who are prescribed SGLT2 with, you know, all the more loop diuretics on the four. So, do you think it is not going to cause loop, uh, you know, the volume depletion? I think no, it is going to cause it. 
and the less common side effects uh, if it is no you know periphery center you're not educating the patient it has been also seen that is going to lead to fourniers gangrene for that matter lower limb amputations have been quite controversial it has been found out that it is not significant but if we see you know on a, on a clinical aspect we, know, we are clinicians we are uh, you know metabolic physicians we can understand based on the pathophysiology that it could precipitate in a few patients the risk of the same so i'm going to put forward different risks which i feel could be op you know obstructing us as using sglt2 inhibitors as the first choice of drug the gu infections it's quite common it leads in the cvots it has also been found out that it causes five fold increase in the risk of genital mycotic infections and who are more predisposed typically uncircumscribed males elderly males uh, males who are not able to take care of themselves and uh, post menopausal females for that matter because of estrogen deficiency and yes post marketing surveillance also proved the same fornia gangrene though uh, only 55 cases had been registered by the fda between the 6 years time but it is quite deadly and it has been seen that the risk factors were elderly males again who were uh, you know alcohol binging or having peripheral artery disease or having peripheral neuropathy were the risk factors included uh, or the elderly patients or the young patients on immunosuppression again a debatable thing of leu glycemic ketoacidosis so i think you remember we talked about the sub types of type 2 diabetes so there was the uh, sidd that was severe insulin deficient diabetes in such category of patients the leu glycemic ketoacidosis is going to be a great hell of a problem so the risk factors involved in such category of patients would be acute illnesses if they are you know prescribed uh, you know they are on metformin and they were on sglt2 inhibitors and we have missed the diagnosis of sid in such patients it is going to precipitate the problem and the leu glycemic ketoacidosis is such a problem that it remains undiagnosed because even at the sugars of 250 you don't you know normally don't think of getting a ketone levels done and because of the glycosuria effect there is going to be lesser sugar levels for that matter and again we also have multiple incidences which have seen that uh, you know at the at saturday night uh, there is binging of alcohol not taking any food patients are on metformin and sglt2 inhibitors which can precipitate eu glycemic ketoacidosis with a uh, you know time depletion i'm just going to rush through some cases so all right all right sorry sorry so okay the fourth cause uh, uh, which would again uh, ponder my mind would be the volume depletion due to the osmotic diuresis by the sglt2 inhibitors and we are using the better for it so those patients in which we require the blood pressure reduction the weight gain it's a great go so it helps us in uh, you know blood pressure reduction of systolic blood uh, blood pressure by 4 to 6 mm of mercury but there has been you know incidences between 1.2 to 1.5% of osmotic diuresis leading to orthostatic or whether you can say postural hypotension typically in elderly males having autonomic dysfunction even in canvas this was uh, proven and the word of caution is whenever we are using sglt2 inhibitors we have seen the rampant use of sglt2 inhibitors by our cardiologist friend and they were you know in the initially phase initial phase they were put on the same amount of loop diuretics and the sglt2 was you know added and these patients you know typically used to present to our opd that after this new medicine has been added i am having dizziness and i am having started having fall so this is something which is very much important again uh, the risk of acute kidney injury per se is less it accounts to only 0.3% but again it is very important in which category of patient the risk is high it's again going to be the elderly patients patients who are sarcopenic patients who have uh, been on loop diuretics for the you know for the uh, efficiency of uh, reducing the heart failure risk but again such category of patients are something which need to be looked into i think dr mayur uh, highlighted the fact that sglt2 inhibitors can be used below 30 egf or also that's fair enough but the the efficacy the glycosuric effect that we want is not going to be there below 30 it is going to have uh, a, a protective uh, benefit that we can say of so for that matter you can use it but above 30 is a way above above talking about the bone fracture risk again Uh, there are multiple all the cvots have uh, shown the results that it is not that higher risk but canvas again proved it wrong and there was risk of the same because of the history of orthostatic hypotension leading to fragility fractures and i uh, uh, orthostatic hypotension uh, which led to risk of fractures in uh, post menopausal females for the same and again uh, last thing would be about the sarcopenia uh, sglt2 inhibitors in those patients who are already lean and if we are using sglt2 inhibitors they can lead to sarcopenia 
so i'm just going to uh, you know just give you a few glimpses in the last one minute ada itself says it has to be an individualistic approach so how can we use sglt to inhibit as a blanket therapy for all type 2 diabetes would be my question and i'm going to brisk through four cases a 35 year male diabetic since 2 years no co no uh, complications bmi of 30 hba1c of 8.5 on metformin 2 g per day and has had a family history significant but but you would love to give sglt2 inhibitors to this patient but he has history of recurrent renal stones and recurrent uti so do you think sglt2 would be still a viable option in such a patient secondly a 50 year old uh, female patient with a history of premature menopause no complications again but the bmi of 35 diagnosed recently with diabetes but she has because of premature menopause urge incontinence history of vaginal dryness recurrent mycotic infection so again would you risk your patient getting into sglt2 inhibitors for this matter case 3 this is interesting one a 40 year male with type 2 diabetes for past 6 months with lot of sugars going haywire no uh, you know no track of the sugars bmi of 26 he gives a history of weight loss of around 5 kg in the past 6 months he was diagnosed with autoimmune hypothyroidism one year back which gives us a glimpse maybe this patient is a case of lada but uh, and he was prescribed by his family physician 2 grams of metformin without any second drug additionally he, this patient presents to us and when we see his hba1c is 9% c peptide is 0.8 and the random sugar is 286 but the gad antibody is negative it could be the beta cell uh, you know fatigue or it could be the sid category that we had talked about earlier so do you think again sglt2 inhibitors can be used in this case i don't think so last would be again this these are the very common cases we see day in and out in our clinical practice an 80 year male patient with a bmi of 26 with a known case of hypertension and coronary artery disease and ejection fraction of 30 so again we are pampered to use an sglt2 but wait a minute he is a chronic smoker with a peripheral vascular uh, with a lower limb doppler suggesting of peripheral vascular disease he also has had a history of femoral neck fracture one year back history of bph Uh, and he is taking medications for the same he is on ccb arb combination antiplatelet statins loop diuretics and he has been diagnosed with diabetes he is on metformin so would you take a call of giving sglt2 to, to this patient i think no just to give a last note 50% patient type 2 diabetic patients are having atherosclerotic heart disease the rest 50 do not have those risk factors but yes there is a dimension of using sglt2 inhibitors as a primary preventive agent but we have to have a word of caution we have to have a watchful optimism while using sglt2 inhibitors and cannot use it as a blanket therapy for all patients and typically elderly frail patients or patients with autonomic dysfunction patients with sarcopenia patients with very low insulin levels cannot be prescribed sglt2 inhibitors just on a go thank you